I am so sorry to hear that. Okay, the mass professor is on the air once more, bringing you truth, justice, and the American way of life. Oh, bloody hell. Uh. Okay, so I still have to. Pull up the Finally. Um, all right. So uh, last time we did uh, uh, chapter one, and while many of the things that we saw there we already knew, uh, they gave us a new perspective on uh, uh, a new perspective on automation. One five. It was with that. Uh, right, so we will cover uh, these sections. All right, so when we talk about uh, manufacturing, uh, they're giving us the official definitions here. Application of physical and chemical processes to alt Of course, it always helps if you push the PC button on on the Q view. And this one was chapter two. Chapter two, yes. Uh, application of physical and chemical processes to alter the geometry, properties, and or appearance of a given uh, okay. starting material to make parts or products. Uh, manufacturing also includes the joining of multiple parts to make assembled products. It is accomplished by a combination of machinery, tools, power, and manual labor. Uh, almost always carried out as a sequence of operations. I would say that fourth point is not true. It's going to be accomplished, not almost <laughs> always accomplished, as a sequence of operations. Uh, uh, ju just by the nature of how we do things. All right. So, within this definition, we can envision uh, using this diagram that we have material that is coming into the process. We have machinery, tools, power, and labor not all of these necessarily have to be in place. Uh, uh, for example, uh, machinery and power might not be needed, depending on how complicated a part or product we're talking about. This produces a completed part or product, and we may have waste or scrap that comes out of the process. When we think of manufacturing, we also have an economic definition. Transformation of materials into items of greater value by means of one or more processing and or assembly operations. Manufacturing adds value to the materials. So they give us the examples of iron ore being converted to steel as adding value, making sand into glass as adding value, or refining, refining petroleum into plastic or other products as value. Um, 
I personally go with Henry Ford's definition of wealth, that wealth is only created by, uh, by creation or ex extraction. So in other words, by making products uh, and services that didn't exist before, or by doing things like mining coal or uh, uh, cutting down trees to make lumber, things of that nature. Uh, so, an illustration of the manufacturing economic definition, we have our starting material or raw material, the manufacturing process adds value to the material in processing, and then we have a completed part or product. Within this, we think of industries in terms of classification. We have primary industries where we are cultivating and exploiting natural resources. So that would be agriculture, mining, silviculture, the growing of trees, uh, or managing uh, a forest, as, as it were. Secondary industries convert the output of primary industries into products. Uh, so that would be manufacturing, power generation, construction. And tertiary industries would be uh, services. Um, banking, education, government, legal services, retail trade, transportation. Uh, okay, I was thinking more directly of services uh, uh, creating uh, value uh, as, for example, the uh, installation of things in your home, but carry on. All right, so the uh, authors give us a list of uh, manufacturing industries, food, textiles, wood, paper, chemicals, ceramics, basic metals, fabricated products, other products, and the International Standard Identification Code uh, for those. Uh, here, uh, right, so uh, one of the things uh, that uh, we do in our larger uh, manufacturing groups is that we look at, uh, we look at how we classify industries uh, and we often have giant books that tell us who does all these things so that if you're looking for a supplier you can start calling up and say Acme Products, hey can y'all uh, make some da 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 for us? Um, we often classify industry as either a process industry or a dis discrete product or part industry. So a process industry, things like chemicals, petroleum, metals, foods, beverages, power generation, these are often characterized by continuous production, or, or at least large batch production. Dis discrete product uh, industries, cars, aircraft, appliances, machinery, the parts for any of these, 
Um, continuous production is often employed in these circumstances, although it can be batch production. Uh, when they say uh, continuous in pro uh, production, I would say that is more like a lean, one-piece flow kind of situation. All right, so they give us an illustration of how does that, uh, how does that work. Uh, continuous in uh, production in the process industries uh, often it, uh, we could characterize that as being like refineries that we uh, that we see where you have huge numbers of processes going on, but they're just feeding from one to the other to the other until we have the products that we're looking at. Whereas the discrete industries. We're talking one piece flow as being uh, uh, as being the standard in my mind. Although both products can use batches. For example, when they make uh, pudding, uh, that is not a continuous flow process. That is a batch process. They have a very large vat that they fill with the ingredients and they stir it up and heat it and do what's needed. Um, and then when they use all of that up, they, they start on the next batch. Um, in discrete industries, we can use batch, but we should be very careful of that. We know the, uh, the ills that can be, befall us in any kind of a uh, batch uh, uh, process industry. All right, so uh, there's always going to be operations that we have to use to turn our raw materials into our finished product. Our product. For discrete products, those operations are going to be things like processing and assembly operations, material handling, inspection and testing, and coordination and control of all of that. Here they try to break down manufacturing process into processing operations and assembly operations. Uh, of course, in a discrete manufacturing process, you would often end up doing a lot of both sides of this. So when we're uh, talking about processing operations, often we'll be talking about solidification processes when we uh, have to either cast metal or uh, uh, put plastic or other materials into shapes. Particulate processing uh, uh, where we're building up surfaces uh, to be the correct shape. Deformation processes such as forging. Uh, material removal processes such as uh, machining or drilling. Additive manufacturing uh, which we know can be a very useful method, but we're still struggling a bit with the speed uh, that we can uh, that we can use that process at. So, uh, if we're going to use a lot of 
3D printing type processes. Uh, uh, we either have to have very high-end products that make it worth the extra amount of processing time, uh, products that can't be made another way, uh, or very small parts that we can afford to uh, uh, make in bulk. We can have property enhancing operations, uh, so uh, uh, heat treatments are a uh, uh, the example that they give us there. Uh, and surface processing operations, cleaning, surface treatment, uh, painting, coating, uh, thin film deposition kind of process. When we talk about assembly operations, there's going to be joining pro processes, welding, brazing and soldering, uh, adhesive bonding. Uh, adhesive bonding has uh, grown so much in the last uh, 100 years uh, from uh, using uh, animal glue that you had to heat up to make liquid to now you have a huge variety of adhesives uh, for all kinds of purposes. We can do mechanical assembly, threaded fasteners, bolts, nuts, screws kind of thing, rivets, or uh, interference fits, uh, that's where we uh, either use a press to push parts into place or we expand, uh, we expand a part by uh, heating usually and then let it shrink to grab onto a shaft and then other, that most notorious of all methods. Uh, okay, so other factory operations, material handling and storage. Uh, have you already taken facility design? Yes. Okay, I thought you had, but I couldn't remember. Uh, so, from that, you uh, you remember that that's kind of a, a, a kind of a big part of worrying about facilities is how are we going to handle the material? Where are we going to store it? How are we going to move it? Inspection and testing. Uh, inspection usually implies uh, uh, non-destructive inspection. Testing sometimes can be destructive testing. We pull, uh, we pick a part off the line and test its mechanical uh, uh, properties in a way that means that it won't be any good. Um, and coordinating and controlling what's going on, uh, we can't allow, or shouldn't allow, maybe I should say, people to just do anything at all they think of. We need to have a plan that uh, produces uh, at the correct time the right quantities and so on. So in material handling, a lot of it is material transport. We can use vehicles for that, uh, fork trucks, uh, conveyors, AGVs, uh, uh, hoists and cranes are often used for particularly heavy or, uh, or bulky, difficult type of items. Storage systems, we're going to get into that later. There can be simple storage systems where you have uh, just uh, pallet racks or we're going to get into some of the more difficult kinds uh, uh, that fit into the computer-aided manufacturing. 
Uh, automatic identification and data capture. Uh, this is uh, can be done with barcodes. Can be done with RFID uh, chips, and we'll talk about some other ways that we uh, do uh, automatic identification later on. So, uh, the uh, time that a part spends being worked on is, uh, well, 95% tends to be waste, uh, according to uh, uh, Womack and Jones, 95% is typical uh, for uh, uh, for a part or a product. Uh, is it for 95% of its time to be waste? The 5% is often a lot of it is actually putting it in place, making sure checking with gauges or uh, measurement instruments. Uh, and only a bit is actually cutting or shaping somehow. Uh, all right, so inspection, we're going to examine the product and its different features to make sure that they're conforming to our de design specs. So we might be looking for variables uh, where we are measuring is the shaft diameter right, is the length right. Uh, usually you're only measuring critical variables, right? If it doesn't matter if the shaft is uh, an eighth of an inch uh, too long or a quarter inch too long, yeah. just as long as it's the correct distance between two certain points, then you're not, uh, uh, then that length isn't going to be uh, inspected, just the distance between those two points, right? If the diameter is critical, that will be something that we measure. Inspection for at, attri, attributes, uh, 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 they say gauging, but I would actually uh, put a U in that. Uh, I would put gauging and gauging. Uh, because sometimes when you inspect for the attributes, for example, you inspect for the cake, the paint job, and also, as I said, there may be a way to set up a gauge that can t say, "Yeah, the paint job is great," or "No, you got a problem. You got a, a chip or a, a scratch over here." Usually, if you're inspecting the paint job, it's done by uh, by eye. Um, Testing, uh, it can be in observing the product, as they say here. Um, uh, using, uh, uh, using the machine in, and uh, you know plugging it in, turning it on, seeing that it operates, or just seeing that certain parts of it operate correctly, you know, turning something by hand, okay, yeah, that's not interfering with the operation, etc. Uh, as I said, you might also have destructive testing uh, that we sometimes do to make sure that uh, everything is being done right. All right, so coordination and control, we are regulating our processing and assembly operations. So we have process control and quality control. Um, 
something that this author doesn't seem to take into account is actually quality assurance. I guess he's just assuming it's going to be there. Quality assurance is the process of making sure that we have robust processes that give us good quality results in the first place. Uh, managing our plant, we have to have production planning and control, quality control, depending on how much of the process we are in charge of. We may also have a QA department and other departments that would fall more in the manufacturing support area. So then when I, in addition to basic analysis, uh, all right, so production facilities, uh, we are always going to organize in the most efficient way that we can uh, for whatever we're going to do at our facility. Uh, so some things are... Uh, uh, some we have some ways of organizing that we think of as the best way for a certain type of manufacturing but it's always based on the types of the products made the production quantity and the production variety uh, the ideal in any kind of manufacturing is to get to a mixed model uh, manufacturing where uh, where we're not making product A for half the day and then switching to product B uh, for uh, uh, two and a half hours and making product C for the last hour and a half of the day, but to continuously be switching back and forth between models uh, so that we have greater flexibility. Uh, the production quantity, obviously that's just the number we're making. These guys make a, a hard and fast division between low, medium, and high. Uh, but that, I think, would also depend on what we're making. Uh, if we're making uh, nuts, bolts, and screws, what they consider medium production would actually probably be low production. Uh, but that's how they're dividing it up. OK, fine. Do your thing. Our product variety, that's of course the number of different product or part designs uh, and types that we're producing at our factory. Uh, they're saying they're uh, uh, an inverse relationship between production quantity and product variety in our factory operations. Uh, I'm somewhat suspicious of just saying that's a hard and fast rule uh, because we have things like the auto industry where they've worked very hard at producing uh, in a mixed model way and producing many, many uh, vehicles per day. So that's where we are now. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, uh, so so it's not just a number. Uh, if it's hard product variety, the products may be very different one from the other. Uh, and have few common components in an assembly. Uh, but soft product variety means only small differences between our products 
they're going to have a lot of common components uh, uh, from one product to another. All right, so here they're kind of giving us our uh, uh, product variety versus production quantity. Uh, and, um, okay, you know, why not? We can accept that. Uh, if you're between 10,000 and a million, they say, you know what, you're, you're somewhat on the low end of product variety. Uh, I'm going to say, it, at least for the most part, that's going to be true. Uh, why not? Now, some, in some instances, a low production quantity is kind of built into yeah. the formula. For example, if you have a job shop, uh, a welding shop, a small machine shop, where you're going to have somebody come to you and say, hey, I've got this drawing here. I need to have 10 of these made. That's kind of the sweet spot for the job shop to make things where there's going to be a pretty low quantity made. Um, and uh, they're often set up in a way that allows them to uh, quickly reorganize for each little job that comes in. Uh, so, in the job shop, you're pretty much going to uh, be making a lot of the components for the project, uh, for the products. You may, some things you may uh, be uh, 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 doing a, uh, a buy, you know, ordinarily we're not going to produce our own nuts, bolts, screws, things like that, um, unless they're extremely specialized and uh, uh, and it just wouldn't make sense to be trying to order them out by people who are also then going to have to be figuring out how to produce them. The products could be complex, uh, although they don't necessarily have to be. Like I said, your, your local small welding shop, I would also consider to be a job shop. Uh, Right, but that does go up to things like, uh, for example, a, a tunnel building machine. Now that's a very low quantity production. Very few people want to buy a tunnel uh, uh, building machine. Uh, because, uh, well, first of all, we don't make that many tunnels. Uh, and uh, second of all, they tend to be so big and heavy that they don't last very long. And even to move one to the site where you're going to build a tunnel, you usually have to take it into smaller pieces to move it there and then reassemble it. Um, so in a job shop environment, the equipment is generally uh, general purpose, right? You have lathes, mills, other machines, uh, right? But they're not specifically made to do just that one thing that you might have on an assembly line. So we might have a fixed position layout or a process layout um, for that. Um, here, uh, they're illustrating a fixed position layout. I'm assuming they're making a boat. Uh, it, it's certainly boat shaped if they're not. Uh, and in the fixed position layout, the workers come to the work and do it in place. Right, this is a process layout each of these uh, shapes, rectangles, squares, ovals, bigger squares, and circles, all represent a different type of machine 
and they and they have these divided up by the type of machine. Uh, Uh, and that's very typical in a process layout. In medium production quantity, well, uh, they're pushing for batch production. Uh, uh, where, of course, batch production means we're moving parts and assemblies in lots. Um, uh, person, personally, I believe in the lean paradigm where we do frequent changeover and do mixed model setups. In batch production, you can get into things uh, where uh, the whole first two weeks of the month we produce product A, then for the next week, uh, week and a quarter, we produce product B. And then finally, in the last three quarters of a week, we produce product C. Uh, uh, when you do things that way, you, you lose a lot of flexibility. Uh, if we have a process layout, there is a better argument for doing some kind of batch production. Although, again, I would recommend small batches uh, under that uh, uh, situation. Uh, so that's more in the hard product variety. Cellular manufacturing, we make a mixture of products um, and we don't have much uh, change over time um, because we're ordinarily doing a soft product variety, right? You'll have a work cell on, uh, on an assembly line for vehicles uh, that uh, maybe makes the alternators, okay? But even though you have different vehicles coming down the line, they have the ability to make the alternator for any of them. Uh, and so they are operating, making, uh, say it's a Toyota uh, vehicle line, they're making an alternator for a Corolla, then they're making an al al alternator for a Prius, and then they're making, and on down the line. Uh, this is a cellular layout, uh, but uh, one thing I would say is it's backwards. Ordinarily, you want to go counterclockwise with a cellular layout uh, because uh, most people are right-handed so taking it from the right, passing it to the next person's right, uh, makes a lot of sense. A cellular layout doesn't have to have something like this where every machine is manned by a person. It can also, as we dis have discussed before, be um, uh, have various levels of manning schemes. Um, to make it happen. All right, so when we're talking high production, uh, obviously we're talking quantity production. We have a lot of equipment that's dedicated to making just one thing or doing just one part of the operation for products. So often that standard machines that are tooled for the high production uh, uh, or that can also be uh, custom machines because we're making something that is uh, a little bit unusual uh, in shape, size, whatever, 
Uh, and so we make a, a custom machine, maybe starting with a standard machine uh, to do it. Uh, a flow line production, what we would call an assembly line, we have multiple workstations. They are arranged for a sequential uh, set of operations. Uh, to do that, we assume our products need multiple processing and assembly steps. Um, and the most common way of having uh, an assembly line or a flow line is that it is set up for one product or a um, uh, or a set of products that vary very little from each other. Okay, so here we're illustrating a uh, uh, an assembly line in the most boring possible method. Uh, uh, but uh, this is typically what we think of uh, in when we think of an assembly line. All right. So we revisit our diagram uh, between product variety and pro production quantity, and we can see we have some overlap here between job shop, cellular manufacturing, and mass production. But ordinarily, this is the kind of uh, a division that we would see between these. All right. So, of course, in uh, operations research class, probably talked about how do we decide on the mixture of products that we're going to make. Uh, so the total number of, of product units we call QF. Q it usually stands for quantity in these kinds of formulas. It's going to be equal to the summation from J equals 1 uh, to P, which is the number of products, of the quantity of each product that is made. Again, our product variety, we have hard product variety, uh, where we have differences between products, but not major ones. Soft product produ uh, variety, where we have differences between the models of the products. Uh, we have to think in terms of the product or the part complexity, and that uh, and the symbol there we have NP is the number of parts in a product. And uh, for part complexity, and O, the number of operations per part. Uh, even a relatively small part can have a huge number of operations, such as uh, turbine blades uh, for jet turbines or steam turbines. Uh, a lot of operations for what's essentially just a little wing sticking out from a block. So when we get to our factory operations model, our uh, total number of products, QF, is going to be equal to the number of parts times the number of products um, uh, that those parts go into. Our number of parts produced 
NPF is going to equal the the product, uh, excuse me, the products times the quantity, products times quantity times number of parts per product, and then total number of operations in OF uh, equals our products, oh, bloody hell, go back, products times the quantity for products times the number of parts times the number of operations. Um, I assume, as an industrial engineering student, this is not the first time you see calculations of this sort. <laughs> and she gives a world-weary shake of her head for those of you who can't see uh, through the camera. Um, so the um, effect of the number of parts versus the number of operations, um, we have number of operations on the y-axis, number of parts on the x-axis. If the number of operations equals one and the number of parts equals one, we consider that more craft production than uh, any kind of mass production. If our number of parts is one, but the number of operations is greater than one, then we say, you know what, these people are parts producers. They are, uh, uh, they need more than one operation per part, but um, they're not, uh, we usually assume no assembly um, involved. If the number of operations equals one and the number of parts is greater than one, then we are thinking that this is an assembly plant or an assembly operation of some kind. And if the number of operations is greater than one and the number of parts is greater than one, then we think of this as being a vertically integrated plant. So the plant is making the parts and it's assembling the parts into a final product. And of course, vertically integrating can go beyond just the plant. Um, Henry Ford invented one of the first vertically integrated operations when iron ore would be mined at a Henry Ford mine. Henry Ford ships would carry that iron ore to Henry Ford smelting plants that would uh, uh, make that into steel and then that, that steel would be made into cars. So well integrated was that, that iron ore mined on Monday would be a car on Thursday. All right, so the limitations and capabilities of a manufacturing plant well, capability is how much we can do in our own plant. Uh, so they're calling it technical and physical limitations of a manufacturing firm and each of its plants. So our three dimensions, technological processing capability, what are the manufacturing processes we can do? The physical size and weight of a product obviously uh, uh, affects what we can do. Uh, we can't build a super tanker down at Bob's Boatyard where they can barely uh, yank a Chris Craft out of the water. Uh, the production capacity or the 
plant capacity, what, how much can be, we make in a given amount of time? Uh, it, uh, we always try and maximize that, but there comes a point when you only want to maximize so that you can produce as much as you need to produce. Um, if we think in terms of uh, the demand growing, maybe we're running one shift and we say, well, let's go to a second shift. That doubles the amount of uh, capability we have, uh, our, our capacity. Right, if we're already at two shifts, we might go to three shifts. Um, although, of course, in lean, we just say, um, let's stay at one shift and just go faster. All right, do not forget. The book. No, this is copyright. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I went through that faster than I expected to. Uh, do you have any questions at this point? Let's jump into uh, uh, we'll do a little bit of chapter three since we still have a little bit over uh, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, all right, well, so chapter three is on manufacturing metrics and economics. Uh, both of those are extremely important. Um, economics is often neglected these days and people take an attitude of, boy, I sure hope we make money, which pretty much scares me. And setting our performance metrics is absolutely going to determine how good a job we do. All right, so let's think about what some of those performance metrics are. Cycle time, these guys denote as T sub C. Production rate, they uh, denote as R sub P. Availability as uh, A, uh, production capacity as PC, utilization as U, manufacturing lead time as MLT, and work in progress is WIP, W-I-P. All right, so none of these is super should be super new to U.S. Concept, concepts. So when we talk about cycle time for a production operation, the uh, cycle time equals T.O., pro processing time for the operation, T.H., handling time, and T.T., uh, uh, tool handling time. Now, one of the things that uh, confuses the whole concept of cycle time is sometimes we talk about total cycle time, uh, uh, which can be what they are calling manufacturing lead time. Um, in this case, what we would sometimes call total cycle time for an operation 
they're just calling cycle time. Uh, all right, so uh, in discrete production, uh, we can have what they think of as job shop, where one part is being uh, worked in the process. In uh, batching production, the batch of parts is each, each part is being worked sequentially. Um, a simultaneous uh, 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 batch production, they're just randomly grabbing parts and working on them. Uh, quantity mass production uh, really goes back somewhat to batch production, the way they describe it here. Um, and then a flow line uh, mass production. Uh, okay, so. So when we think about uh, Okay, I hate it when they start throwing in things they didn't define already. All right, so for a job shop, our time of production is going to be equal to the time to set up and uh, uh, the uh, uh, cycle time. Uh, for batch production, it. Batch production time is going to be time to set up plus the quantity times the cycle time. Uh, and then we start breaking that down into, all right, the time of production for one unit is going to be TB divided by Q. Uh, the production rate is going to be equal to 1 divided by TP. Uh, so in other words, the time it takes to produce one product or part. Uh, for quantity high production, production rate is the Uh, see. Man, I'm thinking I should have the book cracked open here. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So that's production capacity. Uh, so you divide 60 by the uh, time of production to, uh, to uh, see how much time, uh, how many uh, per hour you can, uh, uh, you can make. Uh, uh, and we assume that our time of setup divided by our quantity uh, uh, goes to zero. Uh, and then for flow time production, our cycle time is our uh, time of retirement. Uh, no, that can't be right. Um, like I'm paying attention. <laughs> uh, time rate, I'm going to say that's our time rate, uh, transportation transfer. rate. Is this the time to transfer? Oh, okay. All right, or transfer units. rate plus the maximum operation time and the, uh, uh, our uh, capacity rate 
uh, is again is 60 divided by uh, our time of uh, 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 our time of uh, our cycle time. Oh, bloody hell. All right. Uh, availability is our proportion of uptime for the equipment, right? So, again, they're throwing in some more things uh, from reliability that they didn't define. Uh, so, MTBF is mean time between failures uh, minus mean time to repair divided by mean time between failures. Uh, so really what we're looking for is what is the percentage of time that the equipment is able to be there doing its job. Uh, or uh, uh, what we would often just call uptime. That that slide makes me want to have reliability class here. <laughs> Where we spend a lot of time working on how do you calculate mean time between failures uh, and mean time to failure and all kinds of exciting stuff like that. Uh, so availability means that as we're going along, we get to a point where the machine has a breakdown. Uh, maybe it's a bad tool. Uh, maybe the machine actually has some kind of uh, breakdown uh, uh, where part of the machine is broken and has to be fixed. Then we have a time that it takes to repair that. Then we have the equipment operating again So we have some amount of time um, between the failures, some amount of time that it takes to repair the failures. Um, we should always remember these are statistical averages. They're not numbers that were engraved in stone by God uh, and have come down from the mountain for us. Um, that when we calculate these, they are going to be statistical averages and not, um, uh, and again, not what God said and, uh, and what is always going to be. Uh, all right, so, um, they define workload as our total amount of time required to complete a given amount of work. Uh, others would define that as the given amount of work, but okay, we'll go with your theory here. Um, so, when we're thinking about this in terms of production, workload is the total number of work hours that is going to be required to produce a given number of work units during a given period of interest. So in other words, our workload equals our quantity times the time to produce uh, the product. Our production capacity is our uh, maximum rate of output uh, that our facility, production line, our group of machines, whatever, can produce under the operating conditions that we're going to be using. Uh, often we will refer to this as a plant capacity when we're talking about a facility or a factory. Assumed operating conditions, number of shifts, 
number of hours per shift, and employment levels. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that I am, uh, uh, am given to understand is that we have a large number of facilities that are operating at less than their plant capacity, uh, their, their maximum plant capacity, because the COVID, COVID prices has made, uh, uh, made the number of things they have to produce lower. And so, uh, as, uh, uh, and so they're not spending uh, as much time. Maybe they've gone from 10, 10 hours a shift down to eight, or maybe they've only gone to working a few days a week. All right, so our plant capacity, we can think of that in terms of the number of production machines, they symbolize that as S for servers, uh, that, we, that produce the same part or product. Uh, each machine produces at the same rate. Uh, uh, the uh, production rate RP. Uh, so our production capacity W is going to equal the number of servers, the number of hours in, uh, times the number of hours in the period times the uh, production rate. Now remember, in a factory, we may have to go through and calculate this for every, uh, every machine, type of machines we have, every uh, work cell, every assembly line uh, to get an answer, right? And our answer Let's say we have a, a factory where we produce TVs and radios. Uh, okay, so uh, we may have machines that are producing things for both those, uh, right? But the radios, we may have little bedside radios and big radios that we would think of as being more like stereos. Uh, uh, the TVs, we might have little baby ones, big ones, the giant ones that I don't even know how people get them in the door of their houses. Um, right, so some of the machines will be able to do parts that go for all of those things. Uh, some things will be dedicated to one a particular device or a, a couple of particular devices. So when we start calculating plant capacity, it can be quite a complex calculation. So how do we adjust the plant capacity? In the short term, we can increase of decrease, no, increase or decrease the number of workers, uh, increase or decrease the shifts per week, or increase or decrease the number of hours per shift, right? A lot of times it makes sense to do overtime for short periods when we have a fluctuation in demand, uh, or uh, look around uh, the factory if we have a, a big decrease in demand and say, Fred, uh, you haven't taken your vacation this year. Uh, if it's going to be, uh, if we have to uh, increase uh, our plant capacity 
for uh, uh, a long term, we might increase the number of machines. Uh, we might increase the production rate uh, by use it, by method improvement or uh, better processing technology. Um, of course, as a, a, a lean guy, I say we should always be looking at method improvement. All right, where are we? What's going to happen? Let's take up utilization uh, next time. Um, so, are there any questions on what we've talked about today? Are there any answers on what we've talked about today? <laughs> How many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's call it a class there. Um, and I will, let's see, have we got? And let's go ahead and um, assign a wee, a wee tiny bit of homework. I have the correct book now, so I don't have to worry that I'll be assigning problems that you don't have. from the problems, not the, uh, uh, not the questions. So Stop sharing that. We'll share this for our viewers at home. All right, so problems 2.1, 2.3, 2.5, and 2.6. Well, and an exciting time was had by all. Uh, all right, that's going to be it for today's uh, class. Uh, uh, have a uh, nice day, and when the fields are white with daisies, we'll meet again.